thanks Laura for making it possible for me to come. Uh, it's lovely to be in Eugene. As I always say, I live in Texas, so when I say it's lovely to be anywhere, it's kind of just nice to be out of Texas. Uh, I'm going to start by uh, introducing myself a bit. Um, not out of self-indulgence, I hope, but to give you some sense of how I came to be sitting here. Uh, the obvious point one might make is uh, a critique of patriarchy coming from a man always needs a little bit of explanation. Um, I have to do this a lot because I've written and done organizing around issues of race and I'm white and around U.S. foreign policy and militarism I'm an American citizen, critiques of capitalism, and at this point in my life I'm living pretty comfortably in the middle class. So I seem to spend a lot of time critiquing systems that have made my life pretty easy. And that always requires some self-reflection, obviously. Um, so I'm male in a patriarchal society, I'm white in a white supremacist society, I'm materially comfortable in a capitalist society and I'm a U.S. citizen in a world dominated by the U.S. And I always say, as a friend of mine once said, Jensen, if you'd been born good looking, you would have had it all. So, <laughs> so I want to cash in on you. Uh, so I want to start there to make it clear that when I talk about these kinds of subjects, I don't pretend to be coming up with great new theoretical insights into the nature of reality. I'm following behind lots of people who have done lots of work over the years. And in the political movements I've been part of, we've always understood that people like me have a role to stand up and say critical, radical things that have been developed and articulated often much more eloquently by other people, but that in fact, we live in a society where people who look like me have an instant credibility is something to leverage. So I just want to start to make it clear I'm not going to pretend to tell you things that are unique and original to me. I, I often say, in fact, the one thing I can guarantee about this conversation in my books is there's not a single original idea in any of them. <laughs> and by that, I don't I mean I think they're without value. It's simply that I'm working from um, material that's been developed not only recently, but over, literally over centuries by people struggling around this system. Uh, if I add anything to it, what I think I might be providing is simply a way of thinking about things, organizing, uh, putting things in plain language. Uh, I was a journalist before I was a professor and uh, got trained to write things fairly quickly and simply, and I hope that's some value in what I'm going to talk about. So let's start by talking about this title, Patriarchy Left, Right, and Center. Uh, implied in that, obviously, is that uh, wherever you go in contemporary America, you will find a patriarchal society, no matter what the political orientation of people there. And I think that's always been the case and remains the case even in 2019. And clearly, there have been all sorts of advances in the struggle against patriarchy. I was born in 1958. In many ways, the world is a much more progressive place around the sex gender question today than when I was born. Uh, but it's also true that that patriarchal system is as deeply embedded today as it was then. And while there have been advances, there's also been issues on which we've lost ground. I'll talk a little bit about one of those. So patriarchy is a word that people will push back against. They, they might say, well, yeah, there's some, some problems with sexism. But patriarchy, well, that's a term for history. That's a term to describe some point in American history long gone. Or maybe it's a term to describe some more overtly sexist society somewhere else. But I want to talk about patriarchy in the context of the United States. So the first thing, of course, is to ask, what do we mean by the term? And I'm going to read some definitions because I think often we don't think enough about what we mean by the term. So um, the word comes from roots that mean rule of the father, but when we talk about patriarchy, we're not just talking about father rule within family or clan structures. 
it's really become a term for institutionalized male dominance. And I think that's the appropriate way to see it. And in that sense, it's easy then to understand why the United States today is a patriarchal society. I'm going to read you some definitions that have been really useful for me. One comes from the late historian Gerda Lerner, who wrote a very good book called The Creation of Patriarchy, went back in the fifth, historically where the system came from. And she says, patriarchy is the manifestation and institutionalization of male dominance over women, excuse me, over women and children in the family, and the extension of male dominance over women in society in general. She says, patriarchy implies that men hold power in all the important institutions of society, and that women are deprived of access to such power, but it does not imply that women are either totally powerless or totally deprived of rights, influences, and resources. So in a patriarchal society, we're not suggesting that every man has total control over every woman. No society is that true. So that's a, a way to start thinking about institutionalized male dominance. Another definition I use comes from the late sociologist Alan Johnson, who wrote a very good book called The Gender Map. And he said, a society is patriarchal to the degree that it promotes male privilege by being male dominated, male identified, and male centered. Male dominated, men control things. Male identified, the society is identified, being the interests of men, and men are at the center. So one of the reasons I like that is, especially as I get older in my memory phase, I like memory devices. So let me see male dominated, male identified, male centered. Let me see, what does that spell? The, uh, I thought that was funnier than you all did. Uh, I said that in a group once, and a guy in the back raises his hand. He says, don't forget, men, men create and control knowledge. There's a K there. <laughs> kind of rounded it up. But I do think that's another way that we can think about patriarchy, get out of this idea that it's simply father rule and start to see the complexity of it. One more quick definition. This is from another historian, Judith Bennett. I wrote a very good book called History Matters that I like. The subtitle is Patriarchy and the Challenge of Feminism. And she said, almost every girl born today will face more constraints and restrictions and will be encountered by a boy who is born today in the same social circumstances as the girl. And that's important because it reminds us that the sex gender system is not the only system that determines people's place in the world racism and capitalism and you know, first world dominance. But when you hold constant those other factors, she's pointing out that girls are systematically facing constraints and restrictions. And I don't think that's hard to sell because everybody has experiences. So most women can reflect on their own lives and see immediately where those constraints and restrictions come. And even those of us uh, who are male can with just a little bit of thought, figure it out for ourselves. Uh, so that's what I mean when I talk about patriarchy, following from scholars and activists who've been thinking about this for a long, long time. Uh, I don't think we can make sense of the world without this concept, and that's important because, as I said, a lot of people want to talk about sexism and violence and harassment, but never talk about the system out of which, it's emer out of which it emerges, and that's a real mistake, I think. One of the ways I have put this is I'm borrowing from a line from a famous um, geneticist and evolutionary bi biologist named Theodosius Dobchansky. He's Ukrainian, and I'm pretty sure I did not pronounce that right. But he's uh, probably one of the greatest evolutionary biologists of the 20th century. And the line he's most famous for is, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. There's no way to be a biologist, to talk sensibly about biology without, a, without evolutionary theory. And so if you adapt that, I think we can say nothing in sex gender politics makes sense except in the light of patriarchy. You take patriarchy out, and it's hard to make sense of that system. Now, um, I'm going to go on, obviously, and talk about feminism. My own roots are in feminism going back 30 years when I started graduate school and stumbled into this way of thinking that really changed my own life. Uh, but I'll leave that 
maybe for conversation, because we all have a kind of story about how we first understood this stuff. But let me move on and, and then talk about left, right, and center. You know, how do we make sense of patriarchy in this culture uh, across the political spectrum? Uh, and I'm going to start with the center. It's been on my mind the last few days, especially um, because of an American Psychological Association report that some of you may have been aware of because it got a little bit of news coverage. So this is called the uh, APA, that's the main group that um, organizes psychologists in this country. The APA guidelines for the psychological practice with boys and men. So it's a set of guidelines for how practicing therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists and such should understand these questions in dealing with clients who are boys and men. It came out in August in 2018, and it got a little bit of play in the news, far beyond what most APA reports get, because it talked about this concept of toxic masculinity and how responsible psychological professionals should be aware of these things in treating boys and men. Uh, I'm going to use this as an example of the center because if you read the report, and it's available online, in its 31 pages, you will find only four uses of the word patriarchy or patriarchal. And they're mostly sort of marginal uses. 31 pages, only four times will you see the word patriarchal. Uh, but there's no real explication of what the term means. There's no sense that there's a system out there. It's an example of the places in the culture where people do take seriously the question of gender politics and its effect on people, in this case psychologically, but never really get at the underlying system. Um, so again, talking about the way toxic masculinity, this idea that the way we socialize boys into being a man, includes all sorts of practices and postures that are not only detrimental to girls and women, the most obvious one being through violence, but also detrimental to boys and men themselves, that there are negative psychological outcomes. The most obvious ones are, uh, the, the phrase they use in the report is restrictive emotionality. I like that. Psych psychologists always come up with terms to confuse us. So restrictive emotionality. Now, most of us who were raised male in this culture know what that means, yes? At some point we were taught not to express the full range of human feelings out of fear of being labeled as me. And of course, women know about this too because they deal with the consequences sometimes of that restrictive emotionality. Right? So there's all that kind of language in this uh, report, but no sense of the system out of which it comes. And so I think the, the center, whatever the center means these days, <laughs> uh, the political spectrum in this country is now so distorted beyond recognition that the words right, left, and center sometimes are even hard to understand. I'm trying to turn it off. That's OK. Um, but he, any, I was thinking of the, the biblical admonition about that he, I think the phrase is, let he who has not sinned throw the first stone. Is there anyone in this room who has never left their cell phone on and it ring in an inappropriate place? So only those people can condemn you for... And those people don't exist. Yes, and there's no one who has not fumbled for, oh my god, how can I turn this off? That's the correct use of picture of people. Yeah. Right. All right, uh, so you see this sort of centrist recognition that the systematic rape, harassment, child sexual assault, and exploitation of women is a bad thing, right? and that the culture has now been forced to recognize that. It's not just the Me Too movement, it's just that steady, and this is in some sense progress, where issues that were once considered uh, marginal, usually a problem for an individual person, not societal in nature, are now being wrestled with in new ways. But it's very difficult 
to deal with problems when you cannot deal honestly with why the problems exist. So why do men have, to go back to that phrase, sometimes struggle with restrictive emotionality? It's not a genetic problem. It's not a result of um, our DNA. So this is the problem, I think, with the censure when it comes to these issues. Just to drive this home and I'll move on, a couple of quotes from that report that I think make this obvious. This is one of those four uses of the term patriarchal. Growing up in a patriarchal society may also contribute to important public health concerns such as gender-based violence. Okay, that's my idea of a joke line, okay? <laughs> so obviously my sense of humor is uh, you've got to be calibrated here for... for okay, let me repeat. Okay. Whenever you have to explain a joke, you know. You're, if you're a comedian and you're on stage and people don't laugh at your jokes and then you have to explain it, you might as well just walk off now. But I came a long way to be here, so you're stuck with me for a while. Longer. Growing up in a patriarchal society may, this was the key term, may also contribute to important public health concerns such as gender-based violence. Does anybody in the room think that growing up in a patriarchal society may have something to do with gender-based violence? <laughs> or at least dispatch with the may, right? I mean, this is the kind of fear you can see percolating through this center, centrist kind of approach. Uh, one more, just, so this is a joke, this is funny too, so. <laughs> no, you wait, no, wait, let me explain. When I say something to be funny, you wait till I say it, then you laugh, okay? You know, any of us, new career in stand-up comedy. Side. Feminist scholars have argued that some men use violence and control in relationships as a way of maintaining sexist beliefs and dominance over women. Now, the, the thing I found amusing about that was the attribution of, again, a statement that seems to me about roughly equivalent to saying the sun will come up in the east tomorrow. So it's the obvious nature of it. But attributing it to feminist scholars. So there's this group of people, feminist scholars, of course, we know that they can't be fully trusted because they're feminists, have argued that some men use violence and control in relationships as a way of maintaining sexist beliefs and dominance over men. <coughs> the painful reality of that statement need no scholarly attribution. It's the experience of so many people in society. So again, patriarchy, patriarchy left, right, and center. Starting with center, I think that's the problem that patriarchy drops out. It's not part of the conversation. Uh, and I think that's a real problem. All right. Um, to talk about right and left, I thought I would ground that discussion in the part of feminist organizing I'm most familiar with, which is what is typically called the feminist anti-pornography movement. The movement that 19th and early 20th century feminist organizing that won the right to vote uh, started naming these problems, especially problems around violence, and recognizing that they were not simply problems that individuals had in relationships, but they were systemic and societal in nature. Um, the famous consciousness-raising groups where women got together and talked about their lives and saw the commonalities, and out of that came you know, what we now call feminist theory. And I, I, I dwell on that a lot because that was a time when there was no feminism in the academy. There were no women's studies departments. All of this thinking and, and uh, theorizing came out of real world experiences of people. Eventually it filtered into universities, of course, and took on a scholarly past, uh, but that's its origins. Okay. Well, when women started analyzing, again, especially the, the epidemic levels of violence that were just routine in society, uh, people started looking for the, the cultural support system for that kind of violence. And wh why is that violence so prevalent? Why is it so invisible? Why is there so little done about it? And not surprisingly, women, feminists, early feminists started looking at mass media because in a mass media society, that's part of that cultural support system. So there were early feminist critiques of Hollywood movies, of television, of advertising. All of that cultural mass-mediated production was subject to critique. Eventually also, the, at the time, 
the uh, emerging pornography industry. So in the 1970s, pornography was moving from what had been a fairly marginal media genre, largely underground, to a more open and culturally acceptable. This was what they sometimes call the golden age of porn, when porn moved into mainstream movie theaters and all of a sudden was part of the society. So that feminist critique of pornography, which is most associated with um, Andrew Dworkin, uh, for my money, one of the most important feminist writers, and in fact one of the great writers more generally in the United States in the last half of the 20th century. Well, what is this feminist critique of pornography? Most of you in the room are aware of it, but to summarize it, I would say that you had to put it into a bumper sticker. Right? The feminist critique of pornography is that, contrary to what many people want to say, pornography is not just sex on film. It's not just ordinary, average, everyday, quote unquote, normal sexual activity that you see reflected in culture, made into a movie. In fact, I, I think this was Andrew's, Andrew Dworkin's uh, central insight that pornography is sex in the context of domination and subordination. It is the, erotic, the eroticization, the sexualization of domination and subordination. That if you actually look at pornography, you look at the actual images in it, what you will see is a distinct pattern of the sexualizing of domination and subordination. The primary dynamic in what we typically call heterosexual or straight porn, which is the vast majority of the market, that is pornography that depicts primarily heterosexual sex between men and women, uh, that the main domination subordination dynamic is male over female. That's the kind of animating dynamic that gives pornography its charge. And the pattern that Andrea identified, and which has continued to be the pattern, is of that eroticizing of male domination and female subordination. Now it's important to note that that is not the only domination subordination dynamic that's eroticized in pornography. If you look at the content of porn, now a quick footnote here. Obviously pornography is a term that describes a whole lot of different kinds of sexually explicit material. When I talk about pornography, I'm talking about the pornography industry, the vast majority of images in the world produced by an industry that is profit driven. And in the conversation I'm going to have right now, I'm talking about the heterosexual porn industry, which is the vast majority of that pornography. And the vast majority of the consumers of that are men, heterosexual men. So that's what we mean when we talk about pornography. And the interesting thing about the pornography industry is that it not only sexualizes male domination and female subordination, it sexualizes every other domination and subordination dynamic you can imagine. One of the primary ones is race. Pornography is without a, a question the most overtly racist mass media genre in this country today. And I'm not talking about subtle racist trends that you need a PhD in English to figure out. I'm talking about blunt, stereotypical racist, excuse me, racist images uh, that really mirror the worst of the, the virulent white supremacy of the culture. Right? But it's not just gender, it's not just race. Any dynamic where there is a group with more power and a group with less will be sexualized in pornography. It's often said, and it's in my experience after 30 years of work, true that any domination subordination dynamic you can imagine has already been pornographized. It's been made into pornography, up to and including uh, what I was, thought was kind of the most chilling example was disability pornography, using pornography using primarily women who are disabled. Right, so this, this domination subordination dynamic sexualized. Right, that's the core of the feminist critique of pornography. It's a, a deep and rich critique that we could talk about in other ways, but I just want to stay on those images, which are then, of course, produced in the pornography industry with real people. Uh, and the patterns of exploitation of women in pornography are well established as well. All right. So here's a critique of a sexist, racist, um, media genre. Let's look at how the left 
react to that. And by the left, I mean the non-feminist left, the traditional left that focuses on things like a critique of capitalism, a critique of imperialism, the left. So the left traditionally has been critical of those kinds of practices. Uh, what has been the general reaction of the left to the feminist critique of pornography? Well, it has not been supported. Now, by that, I don't mean every single leftist is you know, pro-pornography. I'm talking about the pattern. And again, after 30 years of work in this, in, in, I think I can say that with some uh, authority, and uh, it's really not a pattern hard to discern. Mm -hmm. So, it's an interesting phenomenon that the left that typically is critical of these things uh, isn't. So if you go into a left organization, a left setting, a left discussion these days, uh, you would find nobody defending the racism and sexism in Hollywood movies. You'd find, in fact, sharp critics of it. You'd find nobody defending racism and sexism in television. Right? You would find no support for expressions of racism and sexism in any other media, yet you find it when it's pornography. That's an interesting phenomenon. Now, you can speculate why that is. It might be that left organizations, especially those dominated by men, simply don't want to give up pornography because pornography is a source of sexual stimulation. Um, whatever one thinks about it, it works. And there are patterns of habitual use of pornography that often lead men to be very defensive when you challenge their pornography use. So it's kind of interesting that the left in these questions about representation, the racism and sexism in pornography, tend to embrace a real kind of postmodern ideology about the complex nuanced play of images and the construction of meaning. These are arguments that they would make nowhere else, but they make them around pornography. The other interesting thing about the left reaction to the feminist critique of pornography is the embrace of this term that now conjures up a whole lot of meaning, but the term sex work. So the feminist critique of pornography points to the routine sexual exploitation of the women used in the pornography industry, and the evidence of that is substantial. Um, not surprisingly, the pornography industry is not particularly concerned with the health or welfare of the people who perform in it. After all, they're capitalist businesses. Um, and from a pretty extensive literature in my own experience researching the porn industry, I can say, again, I think without too much hesitation, the porn industry doesn't much care about the women who are used in these films. Um, okay, so you have the exploitation of workers, yet the left, in this particular case, doesn't seem to pursue that argument, but embraces pornography and this concept of sex work. And in fact, in this particular kind of work, all of a sudden, the nature of the capitalist system drops out, and it's all about individual choice. And the left will argue there can be no feminist critique of pornography because of the choices women make. Right? Well, it's true, of course, women who perform in pornography choose. Right? Everybody chooses in some sense. It's also true that people who work in third world sweatshops choose to work there, which is true, and, and I'm not being silly. Everybody who acts in the world is making a choice. The question, of course, is what are the conditions under which people choose? What kind of options do they have? And the left has always prided itself on not being wrapped up in the capitalist ideology of individual choice to justify the exploitation of workers, but to resist that. So, uh, in this one case again, what would, one would expect to be a pattern of left analysis goes out the window. And why is that? Well, here's my simple answer. The left can't give up on patriarchy. The patriarchy, which is deeply embedded in the fabric of this culture, is difficult for the center to give up on, it's difficult for the left to give up on. And so the left does all sorts of theoretical and ideological dances to avoid that. And it's an interesting phenomenon. I think it says a lot about the nature of patriarchy.
Um, center left, let's finish up with the right. This is in some ways the easiest because, of course, the right um, typically embraces patriarchy. So this is not a hard, hard argument to make, that in 2019 in the United States, the right wing of the American political spectrum is patriarchal. Okay, I didn't think I'd get much argument about that one. <laughs> but it's important to recognize also that there are different forms. The, the right is like any political formation, not unified. And so people talk about the difference between the hard and soft versions of patriarchy on the right, hard versions that really harken back almost to kind of biblical notions of male dominance, uh, where women really are, in some sense, still seen as the property of husbands or fathers, and a softer version that knows that's a tough sell in a modern society to tell women they're the property of their fathers or husbands. And so it's articulated in a soft way, men have a natural role as leaders, this kind of, you get all this kind of done. Uh, but let's go back to the anti-pornography movement, because here, the right wing is typically supportive of a critique of pornography. But it's important to recognize that it's a critique of pornography that is not rooted in the same feminist analysis I was describing earlier. It's a critique of pornography that is, in fact, rooted in patriarchy, not in the rejection of it. From that perspective, pornography is considered a social problem because it disrupts patriarchy. It undermines the so-called family values that lead to stable patriarchal family structures. Right? And so, not surprisingly, the, the right-wing forces tend to be critical of pornography but from a distinctly different, quite, quite different um, theoretical orientation. Uh, there is one footnote to that, which is interesting. I talked to some of you earlier about it. Uh, the one thing the right is, is politically savvy, <laughs> and sometimes much more so than the left. Uh, and as the feminist movement did make gains in critiquing pornography, the right wing did start to see that an older style of rhetoric that was based on a moral judgment. Porn is bad because it's the wrong kind of sex. It's sex outside the bonds of the traditional uh, nuclear family, heterosexual by definition, male dominated by the definition. Right? That more moralistic language around pornography was not as compelling to larger and larger segments of the population. So in the 1980s, you can start to see the, the right-wing anti-pornography movement start to essentially co-opt the language of feminism and talk, instead of in, in those moral terms, to talk about the harm to women, to talk about violence and those things. Uh, in, in those years, it, it felt like the right-wing was coming in and sort of taking away the power of the feminist language for their own uses. But it's also true that the conservative anti-pornography movement has also started to understand that feminist critique. And especially the women in that movement, not so much some of the men, and especially the older men, but the younger women, are maintaining a conservative moral orientation. Right, there are lots of things I wouldn't agree with those folks on, on other issues, like gay rights, for instance. But uh, they recognize that the harm argument is compelling independent of political ideology. So there are some changes there. But just as I said, the center can't give up on patriarchy. The left doesn't seem to be able to give up on patriarchy. I would also say, and this is almost self-evident, that the right is not giving up on patriarchy at all. So you have a society that is, as I said, made gains not only around sex gender but also around race and all sorts of other things in the last 50 years as a result of the grassroots movements that we typically you know, group in this concept of the 60s but of course more complex than that in moving forward but it is still the case that it is appropriate in 2019 to argue that the united states 
is a patriarchal society. And one possible response to that, and I often hear this response, especially from younger people, is listen, that's an old fashioned term. Right? Whether or not that term makes any sense, it, it's a, a turn off. Right? Younger people don't want to hear that. It's associated with a previous generation. But I think it's important to hold on to for the very same reason that if you want to understand racism in the United States, if you want to be a part of a movement for racial justice, and I'm going to make the assumption everybody here in the room agrees with that, right? you cannot go forward successfully in that project of trying to achieve racial justice in the United States without the concept of white supremacy. You cannot make sense of why racism exists, about why the dominant white culture is so resistant to certain kinds of changes without that concept of white supremacy. And again, much like patriarchy, white supremacy has liberal and conservative versions of it. Right? It's not a, a single ideology. If you want to understand the problems we have in the sex gender system, I don't see how you can do it without patriarchy. If you want to understand the problems we have with racism, you can't do it without white supremacy. If you want to understand the problems of economic inequality, can you do that without talking about capitalism? You, in other words, you can't talk about these phenomenon without understanding the system out of which they emerge. And the one that increasingly is on our minds, I think, is the, the domination subordination dynamic, not only within the human family, which we've been talking about, around these key, these four key notions of race, or gender, race, class, and nationality, the, the world system, and the inequality in that. Those are problems within the human family. Yes? problems in relationships between humans. All of those problems emerge out of systems based on a domination subordination dynamic. Right? Male over female, white over non-white, wealthy over working and poor, and eventually, of course, the United States over everyone else. Right? Sexism, racism, class divisions, imperialism, all these terms. We need to understand the system to make sense of how to identify the causes of the problems and potential solutions. What we haven't talked about, of course, is the uh, overarching problem of the relationship between the human family and the larger living world. Again, a, a, a set of problems that particularly we have called the environmental problems that are far more expansive than we can capture the, the word environmental. Uh, what a friend of mine used to call the multiple cascading ecological crises that we now face. Multiple crises, not just climate change, not just soil erosion, not just plastic in the ocean. Multiple crises cascading, falling out in ways that cannot be predicted. That is also a product of a domination subordination dynamic, is this idea that the, the corrosive nature of the modern industrial system comes from that same assertion that there is a natural system of hierarchy of domination and subordination. And we're not going to fix the environmental problems if we can't come to terms with that as well. So I think all of these systems are crucial in understanding it. And just as much as any of the others, patriarchy. And the reason it's something I keep talking about so much is because it is the system that I think people are quickest who want to erase. They'll deal with sexism, they'll deal with sexual violence, but they won't want to deal with that system. And I think that tells us how deeply embedded, how deeply woven into the fabric of our lives patriarchy is, which in some ways should not be surprising because in purely in historical terms, it's the system of the ones we've been naming that goes back the furthest in human history. It's not just a product of the last 500 years European domination over the last 250 years of capitalism. It's a product of thousands of years, probably four to 6,000 years of patriarchy. Now, you might say to yourself, well, there you go, Jensen. It was kind of a downer lecture, and now you managed to end on a really depressing note. So let me pull this back for the upbeat ending. Is there anybody ready for the upbeat ending? Yeah. OK, upbeat ending. So if you think about that, that these patriarchal systems have been present on the planet 
not in every square inch of the planet. Obviously, you know, history is complex. But we've been dealing with patriarchy for, let's say, the last 5,000 years. It seems kind of overwhelming. You know, how are you going to deal with that? It's important to remember that there was history before patriarchy. That human societies existed for about 95% of our evolutionary history, probably more like 98, 99% of our evolutionary history in pre-patriarchal societies. That when people say, well, patriarchy is inevitable, it's just the way we are, men are stronger, women are this, you've heard all of these things. That is simply not historically accurate. Through the whole hunting and gathering history of the human species, which is about 95% of our evolutionary history as homo sapiens, 99% of our evolutionary history in the genus homo, every human being on the planet were foragers living in hunting-gathering societies, typically band-level societies, probably in the range of 15 to 50 people, certainly no more than 100. These were small-scale societies that were far more egalitarian than anything we live with in the modern world. Societies in which what we call patriarchy simply didn't exist. It didn't mean people were angels. It didn't mean people didn't do bad things to each other. It didn't mean people weren't capable of violence. It means that that institutionalized male dominance has not yet emerged. Right? So the upbeat ending is that when people say, well, patriarchy is inevitable, it is just natural, the obvious conclusion of a basic anthropology course is no, it's not. It's a fairly recent phenomenon if you take the whole broad sweep of human history, which means it's a product of human choices. And of course, anything that we have chosen, we can choose differently. That's the upbeat ending. I, that's where people are supposed to, get to leave to your feet cheering. OK. Yeah. All right. The reason you didn't do that, of course, is because that's all true. But it doesn't mean that the immediate struggle to challenge patriarchal systems, or white supremacist systems, or capitalist systems, or imperial systems, or industrial systems, even if we understand how recent phenomena, how a recent of a phenomenon they are, doesn't mean we have ready solutions, easy tools to reverse them. What we do have, of course, is a long history of people digging in and doing work to challenge systems even when there weren't quick and easy answers. And looking around the room and having chatted with people, I know that many of you are part of those kinds of struggles. And that is the best I got for an upbeat ending. So just <laughs> as long as your expectation, expectations for the upbeat ending are relatively modest. <laughs> I could meet them, but that's where it goes. Now, I talked longer than I intended to, because it's such a small group, I'd like to sort of open it up. Um, and why don't we do that at this point? So uh, I'm happy to answer questions, but there's a lot of people in this room doing work on issues of their own that run the gamut of all these things. Uh, and so I hope that, you know, usually speakers say, ask questions and keep them short. No, you don't have to ask questions and you don't have to keep it short. We can just have a conversation. I'm happy to focus on these questions around patriarchy, but these other issues are as salient as ever. And so let's kind of open it up and just use the time for however you want to. Yeah. So and why don't we introduce ourselves since we're so yeah. small? Um, I'm Barry Johnson. I'm a muralist in the United States. Have you seen her stuff? Is that a muralist? Like muralist. Yeah. Okay, just hold on for a second. Is she any good? Yeah. Uh, good. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, from the elected and there were these women's marches, and they were, they were giants. I mean, they were the biggest marches I've ever seen in the and I'm sure the biggest marches that have ever happened in this little town. And mm -hmm. both of our big main arterial 6th and 7th streets were completely jammed with people. And, oh my God, I mean, it ended up in this in front of the wild hall, and there was a circle, and people were like, this is what a feminist looks like. And, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I was like, I bite the egg on that. I mean, what, what is going mm -hmm. on? This is fantastic. And and then uh, the next year, there was, it was about, you know, fifth of that size, and then that's it. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, what, what was that about? Mm -hmm. Like, there was just such an upswelling, and then nothing. Mm -hmm. like, I've been trying to get feminists Look, look, and people say, hmm, I don't want to do that. Well, <laughs> um, anyway, just like, what, what, 
what, what do you see happening just in the country with like women's movement? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure I have a very coherent answer to what's going to happen with the women's movement. Well, what, what, but, why, why do you think that yeah. happens? Well, let me say two things that might be useful. One about the nature of marches. Uh, and the other about kind of where the, the action is in feminism, mm -hmm. from my perspective. So, tactics that were use that might have been useful at one particular moment in history are not guaranteed to be guaranteed to be useful forever. And marches clearly now at this point have limited utility. Uh, the example I always use is um, the February fifteenth, two thousand and three day of political action to uh, stop the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Mm -hmm. So some of you younger than me weren't you know, aware of that. But Oof. before the United States... Remember it well. That before the United States invaded Iraq in March of 2003, on February 15th, there was the largest day of coordinated political activity in the history of the world. There were worldwide 10 to 15 million people in the streets, all with one single message to the administration of George W. Bush. A US invasion of Iraq is illegal, immoral, and unacceptable. Uh, I live in Austin, Texas. There were 10,000 people out that day. It, it dwarfed my wildest imagination. I had been part of many rallies in Austin prior to that around US militarism, especially in the Middle East. We usually drew 23 people, and we all knew each other. You know, everybody had that experience. And all of a sudden, there's this huge outpouring Right. It, was it was an incredible feat of organizing to get a worldwide demonstration like that. Right. Okay, what was the effect of it? It had no effect. From my perspective, and I was the MC in Austin that day, and I remember being conflicted because I was up there, and when you're the MC of a rally, you're trying to get people excited, and in the back of my mind, I, I said to myself, this will not have an effect, and it didn't. The reason is because the people in power learn as we learn as grassroots activists. They learn how to counter techniques. And at that point, a large expression in the, in the streets of dissatisfaction with an administration policy didn't really mean much if the administration knew that when the day was over, people were going to go home. And there was no coordinated action to follow. And that those people were not likely to take risks to challenge that. Marches that are part of a long-standing structure of organizations to pursue a, a, an objective, and that include a fair number of people willing to take risks, risks of physical you know, violence, risks of imprisonment. That's what scares people. Right? And so those marches in other settings did work. They didn't work that time. So marches are largely theater these days. And if that's all they are, then you know, I, I don't say you should stay home, I, I'm not against marches. The real question is, what are they, how are they bringing people together? And here we're up against some real problems, that people are financially strapped, they have less free time, and we are the most propagandized and narcotized people in the history of the world. And I don't mean that hyperbolically. The United States population is the most propagandized. There's more money spent to control the way we think than ever in the history of the world. And we are the most narcotized. This is the most or entertainment saturated society in the history of the world. A friend of mine, an organizer, used to say, do you know why there'll be no revolution in America? No, why, Andrew? Because of Netflix. <laughs> right? And there's, there's, it's a joke, but there's something to that. Yes? Okay, how do you overcome that? Well, a feminist book club is a good idea. You get people together, small, connected, it's, the, the internet is a lovely tool for sharing information. It's not really a very good tool for getting to know people. There's all sorts of things that people are struggling to understand. That's the best I have, and that's very kind of superficial analysis, but I think all of that's still pretty important. Where the women's movement is going is a big question because I, I didn't talk about this, but the anti-pornography movement is a good example where there was opposition to that from outside of feminism. There was also opposition to the feminist anti-pornography movement from within feminism. And in fact, in the time I've been involved in this, starting in 1988 till today, the anti-pornography movement went from being a vibrant part of mainstream feminism. People were interested in it. They were often persuaded by the argument to where now it is a fairly marginal position. And 
in academic women's studies, you will not find a lot of work asking why are we saturated with the most, the most sexist and racist images in the history of the world, right? Saturated to the point now where there is instant access. And there's very little scholarly attention to that in the academy and very little attention to it in mainstream feminist organizations like now or something, right? Well, there, I, I'm, I don't think I'm, I mean, I have my own ideas about why that might be, uh, but I think, you know, I go back. The, the, the kinds of challenges to patriarchy that make men nervous are dangerous in some ways, right? and people tend to shy away from them. I think, I think our, our, our political climate right now, there are some patriarchal uh, men in high positions that are becoming afraid that there could be a change brewing um, from a standpoint of um, um, there's a lot of women who are standing up and uh, they start uh, campaigning yeah. to, for sure. the 2020. So I think even though there's been a lot of suppression and the way the mainstream media spins everything, which is de decredit women and the energy is changing, we may have, you know, this this movement may get going and, you know, we could, no doubt from my mind, I think we probably will have a, a woman president in 2020, from my point of view. And so I think there are men who are afraid and they're going to do everything they can to attack. And maybe we have a strong enough core of change is going to happen, and you know we're still going to be. Most businesses are going to still be dominated by patriarchy, but you know I think there's there's a shift beginning. So there's you know a shift has been underway for some time. <coughs> uh, we've gone an entire hour with not mentioning the man whose name shall not be named. <laughs> uh, but let's let's sort of bring that because you talked about. But let's talk a little bit about what we learned about this from the Trump era. Right? Um, so that even in the Republican Party prior to Trump, there was an understanding that you could be a patriarchal and white supremacist, but you had to watch yourself. Right? And that there were you know, so-called dog whistle politics, coded terms to signal to either a white audience or a male audience that while you were being polite, you really did understand that white boys should run the world. Uh, and of course, that was washed away with Trump. And what did we find? We found that actually overt white supremacy and racism, or white supremacy and patriarchy are still alive and well in the hearts of many who were just waiting for permission to stop being polite. Uh, and so both things are true. What you say is true. There's, an, uh, in some sense, probably an unstoppable advance of women in business, politics, education, all sorts of other uh, arenas, which one can hope eventually will lead to greater female representation. Uh, it's happened in other societies. There's no reason it can't happen here. It's also true that patriarchy and white supremacy and, of course, capitalism always fight back. And I think, for me, the moment I'm still trying to wrestle with is the Kavanaugh hearings and how to make sense of them, not just because they were kind of emotionally draining uh, and not just because many of us watched Brett Kavanaugh in his petulant performance that seemed to, the minute he opened his mouth, end his possibility of being advanced to the Supreme Court. And there I was, naive as ever. Right? Thinking, well, this guy has not demonstrated that, in fact, the accusations against him are almost certainly true based on his performance here. And there he is on the Supreme Court. So both of these currents are powerful. And which one will win out? I don't know. But I would go back to the point I've been making that the reason uh, that Brett Kavanaugh is on the Supreme Court is because of patriarchy. And we do ourselves no favors in trying to create a more just society around questions of sex gender by burying that, thinking it's too radical. We, we've seen at this point what being 
liberal does. That is a liberal position that tries to avoid too deep a systemic analysis, too deep a critique. Uh, it has not carried the day. And I think um, I walked away from those hearings just more sure of that than ever. I just want to say yeah. something about that because I watched it too. That um, trying to think of the guy's name that was very theatrical. Uh, that is now the uh, so I can't think of his name. Uh, it was a senator who uh, Republican senator who uh, oh Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham. So he was the crucial point. What happened was um, the the lady. So. Uh, Ford. Yeah, um, Ford. she did a very awesome testimony. You know, there's a lot of mm -hmm. things you can attack on it. And then, uh, of course, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not going to Graham. I'm not um, what he did in his theatrics is he changed the tone. So what Ford had set, a lot of people felt that was the truth. He did a theatrical thing took everything away, took all the energy of people's attention, and everyone forgot yeah. what Ford just did. And then Kavanaugh went in with, well, it's okay because he's protecting yeah. his image. Yeah. So I, he can go off like that, but um, that yeah. was no way typically acceptable uh, yeah. to do that. But because Republicans had already yeah. agreed that they were going to pass him through, but I think it's the theatrics of Graham that set the whole tone okay. and changed it to make it slide right through. Otherwise, okay. it wouldn't have went. Otherwise, he'd still be on the Supreme Court, I'm afraid, but anyway, go ahead. It um. gets to, he's getting to what is a surface issue, I yeah. think, and that gets to truth. Brutal honesty and pointing at something and saying what it is truly, being the kid that points out that the emperor is naked, is virtually non-existent and as long as we have these distractions to lie I mean, it's the people of the lie <laughs> we've often said that we should call this the narcissocene culture but i mean really that's part of the overall issue is that there's people are afraid you know reasonably so especially when we do have the military might that we have and and so much finger pointing and everything else to distract, like you were saying, that we're the most distracted culture in the history of the world. Um, you know, yeah. Telling the truth is gonna get you pretty much nowhere, but I think that telling the truth is one of the only ways that we have to yeah. combat it. Well, you know, I, like I said, I was born in 1958, so people are really depressing, so let me be upbeat again. Um, <laughs> So if you go back to the era I was born in, uh, the United States was not a functioning democracy in 1958 on any criteria. Right? Um, not only were you know, women still in the boat, but were kind of marginalized. Much of the African American population was disenfranchised, and there was no freedom of speech. And by that I mean, in the 1950s, uh, US Supreme Court decisions had outlawed mere membership in the Communist Party. You could be arrested simply for believing certain things. Uh, for those who might have been closer in time to it, uh, remember, I mean, the, the United States was locked down in the 1950s, right? And if you had looked around on the day I was born in 1958, you would have thought, this is hopeless, right? Uh, th there's just no way to break this grip. But of course, within 10 years, the real question was, are these systems going to fall to a revolution? Uh, the revolution didn't work out the way a lot of people hoped. But so it's good to remember that that organizing on the ground goes on even when uh, systems of control shut down the public space. My concern is there's not as much of that organizing going on. Right? So one has to. It's it's one of those things. One has to realize we are in the most dire circumstances the human species has ever been, there is no time for anything other than the most radical revolutionary action today. And yet that action is not plausible today. Therefore, it's, it's you know, the, the urgent need to organize with an eye toward the long term. We're in a lot of those kinds of positions where we know what's needed, yet it doesn't mean it's easy or plausible. 
Uh, to go back to the, the Trump phenomenon, uh, up until some recent times, that you, you could argue that the main critique of patriarchy, white supremacy, and even on some of the ecological issues, was not just against the right, but against the center and left as well. Right? That, for instance, take white supremacy and racism. Uh, for most of the time I've been writing and, and speaking about that, I would try to emphasize that we have to resist the liberal versions of white supremacy. That it's easy to look at the Klan and say, well, the Klan is bad, and then feel self-righteous as a liberal white person. Right? But that it was important to focus on the way these systems are so deeply embedded that we have to be more critically self-reflective. Right? Because at that point, I would have argued, the overtly white supremacist reactionary right was marginal. Okay, well now, that overtly supremacist, no longer marginal reactionary right has come back toward the center. And so both things are true. We have to resist those expressions because literally people's lives are at stake often. And we have to maintain that critical self-reflection about the way white supremacy is also embedded in liberal institutions like the University of Texas where I used to teach. Both things are true. Both things require attention. Right? And we're in a lot of those situations right now. Right? We need to, to organize as quickly as possible to achieve any reduction in fossil fuel use. And we also have to realize that that's not going to solve the problem we have to organize for all. It's an incredibly complex time to try and figure out how to be a decent person politically. Go ahead. I'm thinking about um, what you said at one point about how modern institutions and modern academia is doing a lot of uh, theorizing and, mm -hmm. and theoretical work to kind of uh, normalize patriarchy or you know uh, justify mm -hmm. certain modern forms of yeah. patriarchy and it's interesting to me because I feel like it's not talked about very often there's such a big focus on yeah. Trump and this reactionary yeah. hard right yeah. um, and I feel like it's not talked about very often how leftists and radicals are kind of being squeezed in between mm -hmm. the hard right and this sort of centrist democratic institution based uh, yeah. political system that uh, I don't know I'm thinking about like for example I was just watching earlier today there was this talk up in Vancouver Megan Murphy the yeah. feminist current journalist who yeah. I'm sure you're familiar with her yeah. work and she you know, she's been very critical of gender identity politics, mm. not because she has anything mm. against people who identify as transgender or mm. anything else, but because she has some s legitimate, serious concerns yeah. about the impacts of changing laws on, on women. Mm. And, uh, yeah. and there are some big legal changes being considered in Canada and the UK yeah. and, and the US, Senator Wyden of Oregon just introduced a big, a big bill around that here. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if you can talk about that, that yeah. squeezing and how sort of that, you know, you mentioned yeah. the postmodern ideology yeah. in academia, and it's really interesting to me how these centrist institutions, which are very capitalist in nature, they want to maintain the status quo, places like the University of Oregon, which is mm -hmm. built on billions of dollars in sweatshop money, obviously. Um, how these institutions are sort of spitting out this ideology that seems to oppose the mm -hmm. far-right mm -hmm. ideology, but in many ways has a lot of parallels. Mm -hmm. Don't think that little dig at Nike went unnoticed by the <laughs> And, uh, you know, my old friend Phil Knight and I were just talking about this the other day, actually. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm going to answer in kind of a roundabout way, and we can come back to that. But when I talk about patriarchy, I often go back to its origins and, and remind us that patriarchy is based in men's control, or men's claim to control or own women, literally either own or control. And that that primarily is about two things, which is women's reproductive power and women's sexuality. That the core of a patriarchal society is that claim that men own outright in the most reactionary versions or 
have some claim of control over women's reproductive power and sexuality. Okay. That means that a feminist struggle for women's liberation and liberation more generally must take seriously, seriously women's control over their bodies in reproductive terms, which the flashpoint is always the debate over abortion, but it's more than just abortion. It's about reproductive autonomy. Okay. And that's understood across the board in feminism, at least. The one where it gets complicated is women's control over their bodies sexually. Uh, and all of a sudden, this what's sometimes called a liberal or neoliberal, right, this sort of capitalist ideology that says, no, 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 um, sex work is work. It's not prostitution. It's not the systematic exploitation of women by men. It's just another form of work. Now, that has now not only the you know, rallying cry of men who want to continue to have access through women in prostitution, it's the rallying cry in a lot of academic feminism. Right? And uh, it's an interesting phenomenon that the, the support for reproductive rights is maintained, but on this question of sexuality, all of a sudden there's a, a turn away from a structural critique of men's systematic exploitation of women and an embrace of liberal dogma. Why is that? I, all I can assume is that that is the place where men are going to push back the most and it's the easiest place then to abandon the struggle. Mm -hmm. And I've had lots of debates with lots of people, some of whom are my friends who don't agree with me on this. And the question that I've always used to try and put this into sharper focus uh, is I assume that people who have a commitment to, let's call it gender justice, right, trying to create societies in which there is some rough equality between men and women and people are free from fears of systematic violence and exploitation. I think most people would endorse that. Okay. The simple question is, can you imagine a society with any modicum of gender justice if one group of people in that society, men, right, have the right to buy and sell or rent women for sexual pleasure. In other words, if you have a condition in society that says, I can rent you for, sex for my sexual pleasure, right? and obviously, you know, there's prostitution, male to male prostitution, there's a very small amount of prostitution where, you know, women buy men, but the vast majority of prostitution is men buying women. Okay? That's the, the sort of core of prostitution. Can you imagine a society achieving any meaningful level of gender justice if that condition is in place where I can buy you? I can't imagine it. Right? It's a defining characteristic of society when that relationship is accepted. So apart from all of the debates, the empirical debates about what are the conditions under which women really work in prostitution, which I think also argue for the elimination of prostitution. Right? How in the world does one imagine a society with any kind of justice as long as that endures? That's the kind of core question we have to ask. But when you ask that question, the answers are disturbing because you're forced to look around and say, okay, there is an incredible amount of this assumption of the naturalness, naturalness of exploitation all around us. And it's kind of overwhelming. And as you point out, universities are largely centrist even sometimes, depending on how you want to call them, kind of conservative institutions. And they don't take that on, just like they don't take on a challenge to capitalism, just like they don't, in very strong terms, take on a challenge to white supremacy. These are not institutions designed to be at the cutting edge. And to the degree that the energy of movements gets absorbed in the university, then that energy is going to be dulled. I think that's inevitable. And you see it in all sorts of, you know, people have made this critique of ethnic studies, they made the critique of, you know, sociology, of women's studies, where once you get your place in this institution, your material success, your status depends on playing the game in a certain way. And I'm not saying this from some 
elevated position where I think I'm holier than thou. I lived 26 years in the University of Texas at Austin, you know, and I pushed as much as I could, but there were, you know, it's not about who is the purest. It's about recognizing the institutions have these tendencies and how to collectively try and push back against them. Yeah? I'm looking at things from a different perspective. I'm working on a project that traces us from tree drawing mm -hmm. quarters to where we are today. And thinking about the baboons and the chimps and the bonobos who yeah. ancestors have been around for two, three million years and they're still living as they evolved to live sustainably in the same place right. without rocking the boat. And we took a very different path, mm -hmm. which is about control, which is about um, running out of game because we got too fancy with tools, killing the big animals and the medium size, then the marine critters, and then sweeping away the grasslands to plant grains and starting to own cattle and sheep and mm -hmm. breeding them and milking them. and oh, it, the, the control, mm -hmm. it's a different relationship to the family of life. Yeah. This, I can't think of a civilization that isn't patriarchal. And it seems like the, the Talmud, the Bible, the Quran are all user manuals for patriarchy. It's a very big thing. So you've been too cheerful, so I just wanted to... Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, you know, I look at it in terms of nature. And if you look at the, um, the intonations of nature, especially biblical as history, um, uh, then uh, I think there's an effort put forth in the um, connotative part of the Bible that teaches um, that there's hidden meanings that get you away from the patriarchal view and gets you into the view of um, empowering women and uh, I think uh, I think that's something to, to, uh, to consider um, because when you're talking about uh, the particulars of um, patriarchy it goes back around you know around in a circle completely and if you can break out of that circle then you can uh, see the broad cyclical aspect of human behavior based upon human consciousness itself okay and so uh, and that relates directly to nature. In other words, uh, I think you made a very important point when you went back to the egalitarian um, aspect of the so-called primitive societies. Well, they have a different relationship to nature than we have now because they could not control nature. And so they had to become part of nature where we're put in the position of controlling nature and it's built into our uh, consciousness, which is the uh, the intellect versus the intuitive aspect of our consciousness. And we've forgotten the intuitive aspect because we don't need it. It's about man against man now. It used to be man against nature. And uh, 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 that was kind of the uh, reflection that uh, bound uh, these societies together in egalitarian terms. So yeah, let me. That, that would be my observation. Yeah, let me. Both of those comments got me thinking about some things. So let me try and make sense of that. So first of all, it's always good when you're talking about human societies to recognize, just as there is a lot of individual variation in the human species, no one of us is the same. There's also a lot of cultural variation in the human species, and even in the era of human history, this last. 5,000 years, let's say, in which patriarchy emerged. It doesn't mean every single society has been patriarchal or they've been patriarchal in the same way. There are always kind of holdouts and outliers. But it's important to recognize, and I think you know, this is true, that the, the direction of history shifted. Right? Uh, and I think your point is well taken that we have to look at when when did that, when it, uh, the, the way I always pose the question is, what is the key fault line in human history where we started really screwing up? And for me, and I think you might agree, it's the invention of agriculture. This is 
Okay, you might. It's an investigation of fire. Okay, you're wrong about that, and I'll explain later why. No, this is a this is you know this, it's an interesting debate, but but for the sake of clarity here, no, no, because because I, I'm not sure it is fire, but let, let me just finish. So, about ten to twelve thousand years ago, people started domesticating plants and animals, and we get an entirely new relationship between human beings and the larger living world, agriculture. And whatever fire had done, that was a real, you, you would agree, that's a real tipping point. Right? All right, so all of a sudden, instead of humans embedded in ecosystems and living as foragers, uh, relatively low-level destruction of ecosystems, as you point out, there were places where people overhunted. There's still a debate about whether the, the destruction of the megafauna in North America, when we wiped out the woolly mammoths and all that, was environmental or purely human. There's still a debate about that. I don't know how it's being resolved these days. But there's no doubt that agriculture was a distinct turn and that human beings started to not simply live embedded in ecosystems but see themselves as stepping outside and controlling them. And that's the origins of that really distinct domination and subordination dynamic. Okay, now we got really good at that. Right? And this is where you know, I think we have to recognize that it's quite possible and almost certainly true that the big brain is an evolutionary dead end. That the cognitive capacity of modern humans, which allows us to do all of this, right, in the long run appears to be uh, leading us toward not species extinction in the sense that, you know, one day humans are going to you know, all die off, but that which has allowed us to dominate the planet to the degree we do also then sows the seeds of our own destruction. Right? And that domination subordination dynamic amplified by our cognitive capacities, our linguistic capacities, the ability to not only change through biological evolution but cultural evolution, all of this stuff that's been written about a lot, has put us in this bizarre position where we now have the capacity to destroy the ability of the ecosystems in which we live to maintain our own lives. Right? And we're the only species that now faces this challenge, how to impose limits on ourselves. No other species has ever had to do this. No other species has ever had to step back and impose on itself limits. The limits came from the system. Right? Too many deer, predators, disease, hold the, the population. Right? I'm not saying I have some secret eugenics program to call the, I'm not, this isn't going any weird direction. But if you think about it in that way, we face the most daunting task of organic life on this planet to do what no other species has ever had to do, which is limit our consumption, primarily you could say our consumption of carbon. Because life is, you know, a, a friend of mine, um, Wes Jackson, who founded something called the Land Institute, which is an important institute for sustainable ag research, Wes always says, life is the scramble for energy-rich carbon. That's what we do. <laughs> That's what living things do. We go after carbon. And human beings got very good at it in ways that proved to be very destructive. And the first way we really got at it was through the, the stored energy in grain when we started domesticating grains. Uh, all of that puts it in a larger historical context. Your point is well taken, that it's a way of understanding just how dramatic the challenge we face is, and in some ways how inadequately prepared we are for it, either socially or politically, economically, or even emotionally prepared for it. This stuff is, and this is where I think it's important not just to point to the CEO of Exxon or to the President of the United States, but to recognize we are all dealing with this at some level. And it is not just about systems. There is something about the nature of being an organic creature that goes after carbon. We like it. And by we, I mean everybody, not just the capitalists. It's part of being a carbon-based creature. 
Well, there goes my, uh, I was still, I'm, you know, I'm, there's a long-term trajectory of this discussion which will end with the upbeat ending. Oh, we sure. just, you've knocked the hell out of the window. <laughs> yeah, let's go, go ahead. Uh, to bring it back to the patriarchy and pornography part, mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering, like, I've noticed when I talk to people that are on the right, which, about pornography, which I do way more than anyone else, because they're literally the only ones that yeah. listen, uh, keeping certain buzzwords out of it. Yeah. See, like, we can't so much to agree upon, so yeah. long as I don't say, like, these three words. Yeah. Patriarchy being one of them. Yeah. But uh, is there any particular argument you've heard or discussion you've had that plays better to them? Because I know, next door I've got, there's a church, and they've got a whole anti-porn thing for men. Yeah. But then I read the materials, and it's all just so self-centered. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, well, you ever considered, yeah. but is to, in your experience with yeah. talking to all kinds of people, is there any sort of the, the best common ground that might open up yeah. that to more than just, yeah. well, it's harmful to men and it's harmful to your wife and God hates it, yeah. right? <laughs> hey, whatever, at least they're not watching it, yeah. so yeah. I'm not even going to complain yeah. about that, but they really are willing, so many people are willing to make the next step so long as you keep those words out. Yeah. I was wondering if you have any other phraseology that might be more accepted. Yeah, I think you're right that Depend, everything is contextual. You're talking about audience. The first question is, who is the audience and what, what terms am I going to use? What framing am I going to use? That's, we all do that all the time if we're sensible. Uh, and for me, the approach when I'm talking to conservative people about pornography varies considerably depending on that context and audience. So uh, sometimes what I go back to is this, it's the what I call the what is sex for question, right? As a way to engage people. And this is often useful not only with conservatives, but you know, to, to, to say, okay, where do we have common ground? Well, let's talk about the role of sexuality in human life, right? And then you can start to talk about how whatever one's idea about that is, pornography doesn't advance it, <laughs> right? Because pornography is nothing but pleasure acquisition for men for the most part, and with the understanding that women use it too. But, as an industrial product, pornography is about the quickest sexual stimulation for men. And is that what we want to build a culture on? You know, a conception of sex that says you're basically sex is about stimulating nerve cells and nothing else. No, sex is whatever it is, and people have disagreements about what it is, it's a much more rich and varied experience than that. So sometimes I go in through that because then instead of becoming moralistic in the traditional sense of heterosexual sex good, gay sex bad, married sex good, not married bad. You can start to open up common ground on, you know, what kind of in our hearts we're all straining to understand, which is this incredibly powerful, magical experience of being sexual. Why is it so important to us? Okay, that's one thing. Uh, in other settings, when I'm in those, uh, especially those all-male gatherings, where I can sense that what the men are saying is you shouldn't use porn or you shouldn't use prostitution, prostitutes and you shouldn't go to strip bars because you have to take your place as the head of the family. And if you do those things, it undermines your ability to be a moral man running his family. Then I tend to go directly at that and say, so you believe you have this right to control the the children and women in your life. Where does that right come from, right? And, and there you can get to religious debates where they say, well, it's biblical. And you say, well, let's look at the, the complexity of scripture and looks, let's look at difference, differences in interpretation and let's separate out what is cultural and what is really theological because that's one place where things get confusing. People take cultural practice and give them or claim to give them theological grounding when it's not theology, it's just cultural practices. Okay. So in those places, I go pretty hard at it. Uh, but let me give you just a, a, a very specific example. I was speaking at the uh, National Coalition on Sexual, Ex or National Committee on Sexual Exploitation, I can't remember what. It's the predominantly conservative anti-pornography group in Washington, D.C. that does a lot of this work. And because its day-to-day uh, -day operations are really run by a bunch of fairly young women, they're much more hospitable to the feminist critique than the old guard of older men. 
And so they invite us into their organizing and they see that collaboration as important. And so I was invited to speak at the conference where I could see those women in the audience and then I saw a lot of the old guard and the older men. And I went hard at that on a critique of patriarchy because the assumption there was we were all concerned about this, we had different solutions, but we were able to talk. And why did I do that? One is to put in front of those older guys, primarily, um, a critique that they should listen to. Right? That if they want to be good men and be anti-porn, they also have to think about this deeper. And I had them in a space where I could do that, because they were treed up, they couldn't leave. <laughs> right? And at the same time, I was signaling to the younger women who come from a conservative position that it's okay to talk about this. See, we can do this. And we can do it in front of the guys that you're a little nervous about doing it in front of. Right? And I was able to do that because I'm me. Right. I'm a middle-aged white guy who looks like he just cashed out of the military. You know, I can, And so that's all contextual. It's, you couldn't have done that no. talk. Right? You would have you know, been rushed out of the room, probably. Okay. So I think, it, you know, for me, rhetoric and political organizing is always about that. And, and strategies change depending on time and place. Um, it's good to avoid jargon, but sometimes it's hard to argue for a position without a word like patriarchy. I don't really consider patriarchy jargon in the sense that it's, you know, meant to obscure. It's just a challenging term. You don't lead with it, but eventually I think you have to get there. Right. At least I think we do. Once they listen for a while, you can yeah. bring it up. Yeah. Yeah. If you say it off the bat, yeah. they just... Yeah. Or go to the definition of yeah. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Just say the yeah. definition rather yeah. than the word itself. Yeah. So that's what I do with socialism a lot. Like, you know, talk about what it actually is without saying the actual yeah. word, yeah. and people will totally agree with me. And then I say the word, and they're yeah. like, oh my god, it's the evilest thing. Yeah. It's so weird. I think there's a lot of hard conversations that, if one is going to be honest, are inevitable, but don't need to be the initial way you establish common ground with people. It's really on my mind because I just came from 10 days in Kansas uh, working with the Land Institute, which it looked like some of you were aware of. Uh, and we took a little driving tour. It's a lot of fun. I got to see where Wes grew up. And, you know. and I was in places where if I had started, you know, the critique of white supremacy, or it, it would have been out the door, right? Uh, but you look for common ground, and you look for common enemies. You know, like yeah, who do we, who do we all dislike? Well, you know, rich corporate CEOs are a pretty good target these days. You know, you can sort of bond around <laughs> that, uh, all sorts of things. But I don't have any great insights beyond what you've already figured out. Uh, I found it so much easier to yeah. they will to yeah. talk to them yeah. than to liberals, yeah. which coming from a liberal yeah. left background has yeah. just been very yeah. frustrating. I, that, to, to go back to that what is sex for question, I didn't, I didn't articulate why I came to that question. Uh, the original feminist anti-pornography movement was very careful not to make moral claims. Right. In fact, Catherine McKinnon wrote a famous article called Not a Moral Issue. Right. And I, underst I understand why that, at that moment that was important. It was to distinguish the feminist critique from the long-standing conservative religious critique which did make a very narrow moral argument. But I started thinking about, you know, all politics has a moral basis to it. Right? If you say you're anti-capitalist, it's because you have a certain moral conception of what it means to be human in relation to others, and capitalism intervenes in that. So a critique of capitalism is political, but it's also a deeply moral position. And it's just a, a recognition that all politics is based in conceptions of what it means to be human, what it means to be in right relation with other people, and so all politics is moral. And I started to think that there was a way we were limiting ourselves by not talking about moral questions, except not moral in that narrow, moralistic, right. finger-wagging, you shouldn't be attracted to men, and you shouldn't have sex unless you're married, and you know this and that. But the reality that there is a Everybody has a sexual morality in the sense that everybody has a sense of what sex, what role sex plays in their lives. And we were limiting ourselves, I think, by not talking about it. 
And that's why those kinds of questions start to get more interesting to me, partly because they acknowledge that that moral basis was there and you don't, you don't do yourself any favors by ignoring it, and partly because it then opens up a moral conversation with people who might not have the same moral grounding as you, but at least you can start to, yeah. I love the what is sex for question. I'm totally angry. Yeah. I'm totally angry. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And it doesn't require that everybody agree. No. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Um, so I just recently listened to Chris Hedges' latest audio book, uh -huh. uh, The America Farewell Story, yeah. which has a great anti-pornography critique in it, yeah. which is awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, but the part that I wanted to ask you about was sort of related to what you were talking to Stacey about um, talking to people who exist on different parts of the political spectrum. And it seems like mm -hmm. political culture is so fragmented that yeah. even you know what we call the radical left here in Eugene has so many schisms. Yeah. And I mean, we've held events here where literally there were people like chanting at us and yelling at us and mm -hmm. screaming at us who are also radical leftists, which to me I think is indicative of why the right wing is mm -hmm. winning. I, I mean, you'll see the right wing themselves talk about we have all these internal conflicts and we need to set them aside in certain situations. Yeah. Um, and so my question is, Hedges talks about how um, in Germany, in the le as yeah. the Nazis were taking power, you had these sort of far left uh, communist mm -hmm. militants and anarchist radicals. Mm -hmm who were agitating against the rising fascists, right. the rising far right, and they were engaging in street battles and it, it escalated yeah. and got very violent. And the early stages of it were somewhat similar to what we're seeing now with Antifa and you know the Proud Boys and all these far right militia yeah. groups you know, beating each other up in the streets. Yeah. And, um, and he talked about how well he sympathizes with the uh, the agenda of the, the far left mm -hmm. people um, that he doesn't think that it's a moral strategy or that it's a, an effective strategy. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how these, these sort of far left street battles um, in Nazi Germany empowered the state to bring mm -hmm. in this sort of uh, yeah. police state agenda essentially and say we need to control yeah. we need to control this escalating violence and the police were naturally much more aligned with the fascist sure. street brawlers than they were with the, the communists right. or the anarchists. Yeah. And it's a question that I'm grappling with because I also just read a comic book uh, called 100 Years of Antifa History. And it's sort of like this beautiful exploration of people who are really fighting fascism mm -hmm. and you know battling fascists in the streets all over the world. Yeah. And so I. I am not quite sure where I fall, and obviously this isn't directly related to the main topic tonight, but I'm wondering what you think about, about that. Because Hedges says that we need to build sort of big tent, radical, progressive populist coalitions mm -hmm. and um, not compromise on radical ideas, but maintain the moral high ground in these sort of yeah. big scale, national scale political battles, and I'm just wondering what you think about Yeah, I, mean, I think, again, to me everything is contextual. I mean, history gives you sort of broad outlines, patterns to work with, but it doesn't tell you what to do in any given moment. Uh, and so, you know, I tend to be, I hope, open-minded about these things. For instance, take the, the role of violence. I'm not a pacifist. Uh, I think there are often deeply moral arguments for engaging in violence. But as you point out, it doesn't mean it's always a good strategy. And I think the Antifa, Antifa, whatever it is, uh, are essentially giving a gift to the right. Every time they go out in the streets with their holier-than-thou rhetoric and their bandanas and taking punches at people. It doesn't mean I think there might not be a moment in the future where there is a need to resist the state with violence or something, but this is just spoiled kids and playing games, as far as I can tell. And the people I know who really know organizing because they've lived it for decades are, I don't know a single person who I respect as an organizer who believes that's a good tactic. Intuitively, it seems really bad to me. And every time it happens, all it does is embolden the right. So I think that's bad <laughs> based on everything I can see. Uh, 
where does one put aside differences to try and organize? Again, there's, there's not kind of an algorithm to run to know how to do that, but sometimes some issues do have to take a secondary role to something more primary. Right? And that's not true not only among leftists, but even among leftists and liberals. So just to make it personal, in the Texas primary, I voted for Bernie Sanders. In the general election, I voted for Hillary Clinton, and I had no tension around that. And I argued with everybody I knew that they should do that because the threat of Trump was not just another example where the Democrats say, well, you better elect us because the Republicans are worse, which is usually true from my perspective on the left, but that there was a real threat. Right? Now, I thought that was a compelling argument, even in safe states or states where the, the Electoral College was already decided, because I thought that the vote total that Clinton got was, imp was important to elevate as much as possible. I don't think the Green Party has ever presented a reasonable alternative in this country, and I never vote, but well, I did once and I regretted it. Uh, I don't argue for voting Green. I don't argue, argue for voting Independent. Right? In that situation, I made that argument, and I think it was a strong argument, and I, in reflection, still think it was the right argument. Right? Even though I really despise the Clinton political machine, and the way they turned the Democratic Party to the right, and the way they have operated, right? That's a problem. But in that moment, I put that problem aside, right? I think all of these things always come down to, at this moment in history, based on my gut and the, you know, sharing information with people I trust, what seems to be the best strategy, right? And we don't have a lot of winning strategies, so, I'm open to most anything, mm -hmm. but I, I, I think it's good these days not to shoot ourselves in the foot. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of that happening on the left. Mm -hmm. so. I, I don't, if I can just respond really yeah, quick, I was ahead. just going to say, it seems like a lot of people in this country on the left sort of elevate voting to this sort of sacred act, mm -hmm. as if it's like this moral contract we have with this beautiful supreme government overlord that somehow represents God yeah. and you know that's our form of our one form of worship and it's yeah. sacred that we yeah. vote with our morality but I'm with you I mean I'm a purely yeah. pragmatic voter even though I think 99% yeah. of the time my vote matters for yeah. zero yeah. but it takes five minutes so I'm yeah. like sure yeah but my, uh, it's a pragmatic I, I usually have a, a slogan of the year Last year, it was my last year of teaching. I've retired. I haven't been teaching this year. Last year, uh, in the immediate aftermath of the election, my uh, slogan was, reasonable people can disagree. <laughs> so I'd have a, I had a big lecture class, and I would go through it. And by mid-semester, I would say, and remember, re and before I could finish, they would say, yeah, yeah, reasonable people can disagree. But that was important to get people in an intellectual space to say, you cannot denounce people just based on party affiliation. Or whatever. That's so important. Yeah. Now, my, my slogan this year is both things are true. Right? <laughs> and so your point is well taken, that the illusion that we live in a meaningful democracy in which the people's vote actually dictates policy and all that, right? there's, there's reams of data and studies that prove the way elections work and the way policy is made. And basically, what it shows is people with concentrated wealth really hold power. Okay, and I think that's true, and it's good for people not to be deceived by the civic religion of American exceptionalism and democracy. Couldn't agree more. I also think it's crucial to vote, <laughs> right? Partly because people struggled and died for that vote, and also because, you know, as a white male, financially comfortable with a U.S. passport, pretty much I'm the last person who's going to get screwed by the system, right? And whether or not it's Republicans or Democrats, the truth is my life is pretty stable. I, I'm not saying, see, look at me. <laughs> you should all be like, I'm just saying that's the reality. That's not true of everybody. And the difference between those two parties in the direct experience that many people have, people who are on food stamps, you know, people who may or may not be incarcerated and have to deal, those things matter. And I don't think I have the right to say to people, Voting's a sham, man. Fuck it, man. You shouldn't vote, man. It's all a sham. Well, yes, in the big picture, you're, I think that's true. 
But in people's real lives, the consequences of those elections can be quite dramatic. And I don't think I have the right to just use it. And so both things are true, and I think that's what you're saying. And people don't deal well with both things are true. <laughs> if both things are true, both things are relevant to the decision you make. You can't just say, well, that's bullshit, it doesn't matter. No, it does matter, it's true. And that's, you know, it's not easy being human. And it's not any easier today than ever before. Worse. I don't want to share that up. In my thinking, you know, getting down to the roots of mm -hmm. patriarchy and the power that it holds mm -hmm. is uh, men identifying with the role. Some roles have a lot of power mm -hmm. invested in it. So, uh, of course, so what I've, I've worked in my life is letting go of roles up to some good my own sense of uh, trying to connect to myself. Sure. Right? Which, um, you know, I guess you could call grief work. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, but then I noticed that people who are strongly identified with their roles, say men, they are actually objectifying themselves to perform that role. Mm -hmm. And I think when you do objectify yourself, it's, easy, you know, with the monetary system is that these other people, employees, or, uh, you know, you, they are objects too. And so you learn to control yeah. objects. And one of the things is you've internalized the status quo yeah. and you're the object. And so I just see the repetition of identifying yourself as a role and if you yeah. gain power, you get to lord that, dominate that over other people yeah. Yeah. if you give yourself to it. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to use that Point, which I think is important to also kind of wrap it up. I always figure two hours is nobody should be forced to listen to me for two hours. Uh, and then, you know, if people want to hang around, we can chat. But does that seem okay to, to wrap up the formal part? Uh, so you just said something very important, which is that the, the motivation for men to embrace a feminist analysis to challenge patriarchy is complex because uh, in some ways patriarchy delivers to us certain kinds of benefits, at least short-term material benefits. Right? And so it's interesting to think about if you go to men and say, here's why you should embrace a feminist, even a radical feminist critique of patriarchy, it doesn't uh, at first glance look like an easy sell. So the way I would say it, which echoes some of what you said, is that there are always two arguments to make to men. And I think this also tracks with talking to white people about race and other things, but I'll stick to the, the sex gender system. If a man were to ask me, why should I take seriously a feminist analysis, I would say there are two, two arguments. One is the argument from justice, right? that the world will be a more just place if men embrace feminism. And that's just a way of saying, if you believe the things you claim to believe, because everybody has principles around this concept of justice, you know, equality, solidarity, you know, all of us believe, unless we're really sociopaths, that in fact all human beings are fundamentally the same in a claim to dignity. Yeah? My claim to dignity is no greater than yours. So if you believe that and, and it's really hard to imagine anybody articulating a, a disagreement there, right? that to be human in the world is to recognize that all 7.5 billion people have the same claim to dignity. That to make that plausible, there has to be sort of some sort of rough equality. And that we know that human beings are social and without a sense of solidarity, human life doesn't make much sense. Right? So if you claim, if you believe in the things you claim to believe in, you must embrace a feminist analysis if you want to make those real in the world. Let's call that the argument from justice. Okay? I don't know about you, but I have noticed that the argument from justice is not always 100% successful in motivating people to give up their allegiance to systems that give them material, short-term materials gain. Okay. So there's got to be another argument, and that's what you were talking about. And it would be what I would call the argument from self-interest. That not only will an embrace of feminism make the world better for girls and women, your life will be better too. That if you can see that the short-term material gains that come from being a man in patriarchy 
come at the expense of a deeper and richer sense of being fully human, then if you can struggle and get to the other side of that, your life will be better too. And that's why I talk often about my own experience, not because I think I'm so special, but because that's what happened to me. I wasn't, you know, such a, a holy person that I, I realized, oh, feminism, okay, this is what I should do because this is the right thing. I was in deep pain myself, struggling to be, you know, a stereotypical male in a culture, and I wasn't very good at it. And so that argument from self-interest is important as well, with one footnote which is to recognize that when we start talking about the way that patriarchy limits and constrains men, like that psychological report did, we have to recognize that the struggles of girls and women are not equivalent to the struggles of boys and men. That patriarchy imposes constraints on men and boys in ways that are real and often incredibly damaging psychologically and physically as well because men suffer violence at the hands of domineering men too. But they are not on the same scale as the injuries visited upon girls and women. And that it's important that when you are making claims about how men should, how men are hurt by patriarchy, which is true in certain ways, we don't engage in a kind of false equivalence. The, the, the line that captures that the best came from Margaret uh, Atwood, the Canadian writer. I'll paraphrase and I won't get it exactly right. But she said in patriarchy, men are afraid of being laughed at. Yeah, that women will undermine us or that other men will laugh at us. Men are afraid of being laughed at by women. Women are afraid of being killed by men. That's a rough paraphrase. And it gets at that scale, that the systematic violence, especially against women, right, is on a scale so of a, such a, a larger order of magnitude and so much more part of literally every moment, almost every waking moment. But that doesn't negate the fact, as you pointed out, that once you let go of some of that you know, commitment to patriarchy, your life gets better. You have deeper and richer relationships and things become possible that weren't. And that's my own story. And I think you know, analysis is great and you know, having the best argument and all that. But in the end, what moves people is typically not analysis. Um, I learned that about five minutes into graduate school, I think. <laughs> analysis is great, you know, and having the, the right analysis is great. But what moves people is, uh, you know, our hearts, right? And that's most, I think, easily articulated through, through stories, especially our own stories. So it's like moving from living up to the yeah. time of the head yeah. down to the heart. Yeah. So I'll end with one of my favorite lines from one of my favorite activists, a guy named Abe Osheroff who nobody's ever heard of unless you're a student of the Spanish Civil War or were a friend of Abe's. Abe was one of the, I always like to talk about Abe. Abe's been dead now for more than a decade, but Abe was a young communist organizer in New York in the Depression, and he went to Spain and fought in the Spanish Civil War. There were brigades from all over the world that went and fought in the, the Spanish Revolution against, or the Spanish Civil War fighting fascism which is quite an amazing thing to pick up and leave your own country to go fight in somebody else's revolution. So Abe was one of those uh, in, in what was called the Abraham Lincoln Brigade in the US. He went to Spain, he came back, and he lived his entire life as a, a radical organizer. He was a carpenter by trade, and he was living, building houses, but was always politically active. And I was lucky to meet him later in his life, and we made a short documentary film about him. But he used to talk about his experience in, he learned very early, he said, that what moved people was passion. Right? And the way he would say it is, the, the engine of the train of human history you know, is that passion, that emotion, that you know, whatever you want to call it. He said, but when you get on the train, remember to take your carry-on luggage, which is critical reason. Like, don't just, you know, <laughs> that, that reason isn't driving the bus. Right? And I think you were hinting at that. In some sense, we have to recognize our, our cognitive and analytical capacities, which we love to play around with, are not really the, the motive force in our lives. But they're crucial if we are going to avoid giving in to that, the ugliest parts of that passion. And, and Abe 
did a very good job his whole life, I think, of balancing those things. And so that kind of story, you know, telling stories, uh, you know, we've been talking kind of about systems and analysis, but in the end, to go to the question about how do you talk to people, uh, that's another thing, which is often your own story is far more powerful than even the most astute analysis. So on that note, it wasn't really an upbeat ending, but it wasn't quite as depressing as some of the other things, so I'm going to call it. I'm going to call it upbeat. All right, thank you all.